I'm Jeff Plank. If you can't tell, I'm from Microchip. <laughs> and um, I'm going to apologize up front. Uh, my marketing department got a hold of my slides. And they said, oh, you're going to be talking to 100 people. We want everybody to know about Microchip. So I'm actually a uh, security architect at the company. Um, I come from a particular business unit called the Data, Data Center Solutions Group. If you don't know us, I, I'm not sure it matters, but um, we develop like switches and smart controllers and different ICs that the data centers consume. And we've been asked over time to implement uh, security in our parts from a few of the people in this room that I happen to know. And um, I'm going to take you kind of through a bit of a journey of, of what we've been up to. And then I'm going to talk a bit about uh, some other items, clearly the, the DMTF protocol. So some disclaimers. Somebody from the DMTF reached out to me and wanted me to remind everybody that I don't represent the DMTF and in any way, shape, or form. And I am a voting member of the working group. But anything you see in this presentation should just be viewed as an example. And if you want to really know about the protocol, you need to join the working group or go look at one of the online specs. But, but don't assume what you see in my presentation maps one for one, because I'm not actually going to go into the spec itself. I'm going to refer you back to what's online. And then if there's anything in the presentation that's theirs, it'll be copyrighted. And again, a bunch of disclaimers also. Oops. So just a quick view of the agenda. We're going to go over the secure pro pro portfolio of the company uh, from a data center solutions background. One slide, that's it. Um, I'm going to give you some background as to where we're at, uh, talk about the problem statement, then I'm going to go into the data model a bit, and, um, and then I'm going to give you some of my observations and concerns about it. So. So on the front side of this conversation, I said I was from the Data Center Solutions Group. And, and we make this set of chips here, uh, switches, smart controllers. Uh, we make NVMe controllers. Uh, a lot of things with firmware, embedded firmware, boot ROMs, some of the conversations that we've been already having this morning about you know, chip companies and what they're doing to make their products secure, and in some cases, what they're not. But in our portfolio within the data center solutions uh, group, we're trying to make sure that we, uh, we have all these principles in place. Um, everything from secure boot uh, to secure debug. We want to be able to test our devices. Um, and we want to be able to have roots of trust to be able to program keys into our devices. And, and as you go kind of this, down this row of attributes, what you find is that by enabling certain things to happen for a customer, and when I do that enablement, opens my supply chain to a, a set of issues. So by example, if I deliver a part that's blank to you, that then you can go customize and secure, well, guess what? It sat in the supply chain for quite a while, blank and non-secure and open to programming. So sure, you can add in your own keys, but then just about anybody could add in their own keys if they knew how to do it. So for me, I want to I want to lock it down early. So everybody has been giving you today this picture of a supply chain. Um, it's actually a very complex problem, as many people have described. Um, I was just up in Burnaby uh, this week. Um, that's where we house a lot of our ASIC engineers, and we were talking about wafer production. And the more I talk to them about how they do things, the more I understand how leaky it is. And by leaky, I mean at any time in the supply chain, I don't think it's just us. It's, a common, it, it's common practices to go to a foundry. It's common practices to go to a, a subcon to do packaging. You know, that other diagram we saw earlier uh, where there's all these different routes to your customer base for a given component. And as, as a challenge for me, what I want to do is I want to lock it down early. I'd actually like to lock it down at wafer time. It's, it's usually one vendor I'm dealing with. It's usually one set of equipment I'm dealing with. I can track the wafers themselves. But there's some problems with locking it down at wafer time. If you're a company that wants to program your own keys, or you want to do something special in the chip, 
now I'm making different kinds of wafers. And I'm programming the wafers separately. And then I'm sending them out into my supply chain separately. And that gets very complex for a hardware vendor. Because what we'd like to do is make gazillions of wafers and then customize them as late as possible in the process. Like way down here at board time is when I would really like to customize the part. The problem is I've already spent like a year in the supply chain uh, with people taking a look at my parts. And so it makes it extremely difficult to do. So at, at the heart of all our products, which everybody has been talking about today, we've got Roots of Trust and we've got Secure Boot. Uh, it's part of our Boot ROM. Boot ROM is firmware. It's been embedded into this ASIC at birth and it lives throughout the life of the program of the part. Uh, we also have OTP within the part. And this is sort of generic statements, but um, we have OTP in the parts which allow you to customize it. So let's say you want to put in your own public key because you want to do your own firmware development activities. Uh, we have methods to enable that. Oftentimes though, it means maybe delivering to you a part that doesn't have a slot zero certificate in it, which I think is kind of an issue. On the one hand, you want to be able to customize it. On the other hand, you want to really know it came from us. So having a slot zero certificate in it, along with keys that got embedded at manufacturing time is very valuable. But then if you really want to get something that you can program up on your own, I almost have to give you a blank part. Um, at each phase of boot time, you know, out of this root of trust, we grab executables out of flash, we validate them using our public keys that are embedded in the hardware, and we have a staged approach for every executable that is out there in flash. As a policy within the company, at least in my business unit, we don't execute from flash. If we execute from flash, we have to go revalidate the block that we we're going to go execute again. If, if, if we're going to pull in anything we're going to do, we're going to pull it into internal memories, we're going to validate it, and then we'll execute it. That's part of our process at the company. I mentioned a bunch about the manufacturing certificates, and you know, I think this is probably a common diagram. Um, but you know, our opportunity here is to embed these certificates down here on the left-hand side, and we're going to want to do it during manufacturing. And then as a verifier, in whatever authentication protocol you're going to do, you're going to grab our public certificate and you're going to talk to the part for a while. And you're going to want to go look up that public certificate somewhere in some infrastructure. You're going to want to know that it came from us and that it's genuine. A um, couple of things about certificates that I've, I've kind of, you know, there's a lot of requirements, right? You need a unique identifier in every ASIC. Because if I use the same certificate on all parts, it's very easy to perturb the supply chain. Um, incidentally, it's actually easy to perturb a supply chain, even with a unique identifier in every part. In other words, it's quite commonplace to be able to clone devices because you can spend a lot of time with an ASIC and do a lot of interesting things to it. Uh, I just came from a, a conference in Atlanta where it was very clear to me after being out there that the ability to, to basically get all the data out of the part that you might need to go do cloning is readily accessible out in the marketplace. And don't be mistaken to be thinking that it's an NSA organization and they have lots of money to go throw at it. Uh, the guy I saw doing at the conference as a demonstration had $600 and did it in his bedroom. Uh, they also have other projects that are ongoing that are government funded that take like a $50,000 piece of equipment and they say, your project is to go build it for 500 and and they do. They, they, they built a probe device that could scan parts and they did it for 500 bucks. So it, it's not the case anymore that you need to think about these parts being compromised by state actors who have lots of cash to throw around. It's just anybody you want to dump some money to that'll give you a part. It's $200 or $300 an hour to go get someone to do analysis on your parts and, and pump out a net list. And they, they're for hire. So, so we've, we talked about chain of trust a bit. 
Um, this is how we've sort of been implementing. I didn't want to use the TCG diagrams because of copyright reasons, so I sort of remade all my own. Um, the parts that I found concerning about this implementation from our standpoint is that a lot of, well, the CDI is meant to be a measurement of the internal status of the part. It's often, and it's absolutely meant to be a measurement of the first mutable code stage, which is oftentimes your riot code. And along the way to manufacturing, um, you know, we're intended to insert certificates. We're intended to put keys within the device or have them embedded in boot ROM. Um, we have rollback counters and ability to revoke keys and all these other things. If I include <clears throat> those values in my CDI measurement, then the consequence of that is, is that my slot zero certificate is likely to no longer be valid because the device ID is actually generated at a later stage within Riot. And it's based on this CD, CDI as an input, which is the measurement of this first code stack and a measurement of the internal state of the device. And so if you, you know, on the one hand, you don't want to include the measurements of your ASIC if you're going to have rollback counters because you'll invalidate your certificate. But in reality, you almost want to because you almost want to know that your hardware changed somehow out from underneath you. And you don't want to wait till an attestation measurement to try to figure out what changed. Um, the other thing that's a bit challenging is that <clears throat> when I go to implement this first mutable code stack across four or five products, it's getting, it, it's getting it right the first time. Because if I do a flash update that updates this code base, it invalidates my certificate that I created as well. So from the time I produce chips to the time they land out in product, these, this first immut you know, immutable code base actually can't change. And then I don't really want to change any of the ASIC conditions if I've included it as part of my measurement. Um, so, Briefly on how we measure, um, you know, if you if you think about it, this dice engine is input to a bunch of generation of private attestation keys that uh, sign the measurements as you go along, and each stage of your executable is busy doing measurements. Um, it's actually measuring later stages of code, and usually your bootloader is the thing that's in boot ROM, and the boot ROM never changes because uh, it's part of the part. So you do all these measurements, you, you store them in some right once registers. Um, you also, you know, then agree that you'll run the next executable. He'll do some measurements, store it in some more, um, more registers. The next executable is meant uh, to finally, you know, if this was like n executables, you'd go all the way up the stack until you got to the last one and you'd execute it after you validated it. And every time you go up the stack, you're, you're potting away measurements. And you're also applying attestation keys to it as you do it. Um, and then finally, as you come across and you ask for the measurement out of the device, you typically are providing some kind of announce to the device. The reason you're providing announce to the device is you don't want to invoke replay attack. So somebody who's sitting on the line listening to what's going on in the network could just simply say, well, I'll just repeat what was said last time and, and and everything will look right to the device that's asking. So you throw the nonce across the wire, you, you uh, perturb your measurement a bit, and you include it in the signature, and you know, um, you're off to the races on the other side of the wire because you know that the thing you supplied to the device has come back as part of the measurement attestation you did. So now that we talked about secure boot, and we, we talked about measurement and how you do it, Next question is, well, who's actually measuring? And, um, you know, there's a lot of different views on this. Um, this is actually kind of a simplified map, in my opinion. But, you know, you have a lot of attestation responders, and you have um, what, I was, what I would call requesters. And that those words are used um, in the DMTF protocol spec um, as examples for requesters and responders. But in, in actuality, the way endpoints are done in the spec is this, this drive actually could go out and authenticate that the security processor that's in the system is a thing it expected in theory. You could, as an endpoint device, they can flip, right? So one that looked like a requester in one set of transactions can actually be 
a responder in the next set of, of transactions. So uh, embedded oftentimes in a platform, and I've seen it implemented in different ways. You'll have a security processor in the platform. Some folks are implementing it as a BMC. Uh, we actually sell some chips, by the way, that, that sit here. Um, and you know, in, in actuality, you want these guys to exchange certificates and authenticate to each other. Uh, and then once you've proven uh, to the other end of the wire that you are who you say you are, then you're going to ask for some measurements. And then you might do other things as well. Uh, clearly, what you want to also avoid is, is these little bad actors sitting in the system, either sniffing the wire and trying to figure out what your protocol is, or sniffing the wire and just replaying it to you. And so another aspect of it is, well, let's go ahead and provide confidentiality within the network. And the DMTS uh, spec actually tries to do that. So some of the problem statements that they were trying to answer in the spec was, you know, clearly, how do we get measurements brokered around the system? Uh, what mechanisms do we put in place to prevent the fraudulent men, uh, measurements that could occur? And you know, how do you provision and authenticate the endpoint? The spec actually doesn't talk about provisioning very much. It leaves it as a, a, an act, you know, a system designer's plan to go uh, deploy certificates into devices or deploy them into a system right, to establish trust. Uh, but the spec actually doesn't do that. And then lastly, you know, the other problem was they were trying to solve was, well, how do, we, how do you keep the communications uh, confidential? So I don't know if, if individuals have seen this or not, but uh, this is you know, clearly their copyrighted material. But the plan has been to establish uh, this new type five code in the message layer. And the type five code is meant to do all the security stuff uh, within the protocol. And if you're not familiar with MCTP, it's basically the platform level management that allows like a BMC or another uh, processor uh, within a, a network on the system. It could be I2C, it could be PCIe transactions. Uh, the protocol actually rides on a whole bunch of different interfaces now and into the future. So you, you bring your system up, you get to a state, you establish network, you can then start sending packets around on that network. Depending upon what type of underlying protocol you're using, like I2C, it could be up very early in a system. It could be up very late in a system. And that's one of the points I make later on in the presentation. So once type five gets established, and I'll take us through a ladder chain that's kind of simplified, the next thing that happens after you've agreed on what you're measuring, who you're talking to, and that the measurement's correct, um, will actually, in type six, start working on encrypted traffic. And this is the, the, a future proposal um, you can find the work in progress online about it. But the, all the messages that are possible uh, can actually be sent over this type six. So once you've established security, if you want to go get temperatures from a device or you want to, I don't know, do redfish transactions, uh, the, the, the point of the matter is you can now run it over an encrypted pipe to that device. So it's intended to authenticate the MCTP network uh, both from you know, a device identification perspective, it's intended to do the measurements of the firmware to prove to everybody that you're running the right thing. And then it does a session exchange that allows you to actually set up uh, encrypted traffic. So I'm going to take us through the, the 1.0 feature set. Uh, this is not intended to be a complete list or of all the features that would be in 1.0. Again, I'm not trying to talk about what's actually in this spec. I'm trying to tell you kind of an overview of what, what to go look for. Um, I'll actually skip over the versioning piece, but I'll talk to it briefly now. Um, you know, effectively, whenever you're gonna go do a protocol, whatever it is, you wanna, you know, from an endpoint perspective, you wanna go communicate to that other device and you say, hey, what version of software you're running? And, you know, get agreement between both sides as how to run the protocol. And, uh, within the system of components, you certainly could decide as a BMC provider or a security chip provider that I'm just not going to run 1.0 protocol. I'll only accept 2.0 protocol. So in this early exchange on the protocol wire, you can always 
say, well, I'm, I, you're, you're a 1.0 device, I'm just going to not talk to you. Uh, you could also do some exception-based policies where, you know, it's like a fan or some small component that, that really doesn't have a lot of smarts to it. And they implemented one only, and because you're the system designer, you can decide, well, I'm going to accept that fan as is. How, how bad could a fan be? But, um, but a microcontroller like the ones we make uh, for doing data transfers, maybe you've decided that you're going to just do 2.0, and you won't accept a 1.0 protocol from me. So then we'll cover the, the capabilities and negotiate and authenticate, and then we'll talk about the measurement exchange. So the ladder diagrams that are in the documents that you can see online are not, um, are not this simplistic. Um, I, I broke it down just to kind of illustrate the point. Um, but in principle, the requester will ask the chip downstream environment, what do you support? And, and you have to kind of agree on the algorithms you're going to use, right? Kind of at the on side. And again, the system developer can decide that it doesn't like the algorithms you profess you support. So the responder will end up saying, well, I, I support elliptical curve. I support these bit lengths. The, the requester will send back, well, that's nice, but, but these are the two I support. And then the responder has the opportunity to say, well, I got a match. Let's agree to use elliptical curve 384. And everybody's happy. On the other hand, the responder could come back and say, well, I, I support these two versions of protocol. And right then and there, the, respond, the requester can say, well, I don't like anything you had to say. And because it might be on the PCIe bus, it could like shut down the slot, by example, or you know, keep it from operating in the system, deprive it of power, depending on what, what capabilities are in the requester to begin with, right? So, uh, Kind of going down the list of things, you know, I think the intention of all of this was to enable a lot of flexibility. Like I mentioned, fans might not have any capability. They might not even be, have any crypto capability. They may be able to just tell you, hey, here's the firmware version I'm running. Here's a hash of it. Or maybe they don't even, can't even tell you that because they even have, have a lack of crypto capability to begin with. Um, so the intention was allow this exchange to occur, allow it to negotiate down to a common set of algorithms, and allow the, the requester the capability to cut off the conversation. Uh, you know, if the endpoint decides it wants to disallow the activity to occur, there's action it can take. So from an authenticate and measurement perspective, you know, again, simplified diagram, as mentioned before, but the requester says, hey, give me your cert chain. And um, the responder gives it back. And at this point, the spec's kind of empty about what to do with that cert chain. It could look at it and go, oh, I like that cert chain. Or it could actually go and look it up and look at the cert chain and go up to some certifying authority and make sure that that cert is valid. Okay. Um, in actual practice, this exchange could have been on this side or in the requester side, and you, you don't really know which chips they are. So it becomes a bit difficult that all chips in a system can go do lookup. A BMC clearly can. It has a network management port on it. It could go out and look at a certificate authority and make a decision. Um, you could also provision certificates of things you'll accept in a system into, you know, the security profile of the devices. You could even install those security certificates in an endpoint if you wanted to and say, well, I've established and provisioned all these certificates. Uh, it happens at your data center, and I like what I saw when I installed them. But there's actually nothing in the spec that says anything about what to do with these. Um, the next thing it says, well, that's great. You gave me a public key, but I don't know where the heck it came from, and I don't know if you have the private key or not. So here, let me give you some work to do. And, and the work can be in a variety of different ways, but there's a, lot of, a common set of practices that occur. And you ship back over this proof of work. And the proof of work is usually some cryptographic operation that you had to have used the private key in order to establish. 
and the guy at the other end is sitting with the public, and it happens to match the private, so you know at the end of the day that you actually did some work over there and you must have had it. Uh, then you, uh, the requester says, hey, give me your current measurement, and that's where that nonce came in. And then you set, ship back over uh, the current authenticated measurement. Again, it's usually a signed measurement using the private key that's embedded in the device based on some you know, DICE implementation with Riot, which is why I had the slides before. Um, OK. There we go. So if you kind of looked at, I, I implemented 1.0, uh, where did I end up? And I ended up with, OK, I agreed on some versions of, of protocol I was going to use. I agreed on the methods I was going to use when I did the exchange, the algorithms, uh, and so forth, and the bit lengths, and what I was going to use nonces, and a whole bunch of other things, because the protocol allows for it. Um, I will have authenticated the participants in the MCTP network, because I would have ended up grabbing you know, all the certs uh, from all the different devices that were installed in slot zero that were probably done at manufacturing time. And at any point, I could have rejected anybody uh, within the implementation. I could have rejected them for the version. I could have rejected them because the certs were bad. I could have rejected them because the, ultimately the, the proof of work was bad or, or the measurement itself uh, didn't, didn't, was not consistent with what I expected. And again, system designers can build in as much flexibility as to how they interact with that protocol as they want. They can make decision points throughout that process and decide to reject things. So from a 1.1 preview perspective, um, what they're going to end up doing is adding the confidentiality piece to the transaction. And they're going to use you know, like a Diffie-Hellman exchange to establish a set of session keys. And those session keys will be used to encrypt the traffic between the endpoints. Um, they'll all be digital signature based. So you'll, you know, you'll, you'll have proved who you are through an authentication step, that your certs are good, you own the private keys, and then you'll agree on a session key between the two of you. And you're off to the races with an approved uh, key establishment scheme. We also have uh, built into 1.1 preview is a pre-shared key notion. And um, I actually got a lot of pushback uh, for, for being, having that put in there. But the, the reality is that I saw use cases where you know, somewhere in the design process or somewhere in the establishment of security within a device, someone decides to load a pre-shared key. And I'd seen this in some military applications where you know, we were asked to like bid on some things where they, they wanted to have security state at both ends. They really didn't trust anybody. They had a, a key loading system that was independent of the hardware they were using. And they loaded in keys in one side, and they loaded in keys in another side. And no one ever knew what the keys were. And they just knew that these keys matched up with the devices that they were trying to procure. So I had this, this vision that, in some cases, that might actually happen. I also had a vision that, in some cases, the components that we might produce would be so simplistic that they would have a need to have a pre-shared key, that they wouldn't have all this key generation uh, capability built in with it. Um, by example, when we generate all our keys at boot time, you know, we have all these PCIe uh, timing requirements we got to master. And key generation means you need hardware engines, because if you don't have hardware engines, it'll take too long to generate the keys, and then you won't respond in time on the PCIe bus. Um, so we have a lot of timing requirements that we have to build in. Um, let's see. I think that was. So from a, a security task force perspective, um, the state of the, of, of the specification is that we're uh, still in, wor in work in progress state. There's a number of drafts that are available. So if you want to go read about the 1.0 spec, it's actually in a fairly good state. I think they're at, I don't know, dot nine five or something of the spec. Um, it, it's, it's open for comment from the industry. Uh, the 1.1 is actually just a PowerPoint at this time. 
uh, which is released uh, to the public that you can go comment on and make, make statements. Um, they do have a portal, an official portal, if you want to log into it and make, make your comments there uh, for incorporation. Or you can just decide to join the work group and go learn more about it and participate and say, well, I don't like what you've done here. Um, I, I will say there's an, a, quite a robust number of people already on the project. And every time we add a new person to the project, we go backwards in time, uh, literally, like months backwards in time. And then if uh, some of the original cast members don't show up that day, uh, they'll, uh, it, it's a problem too, because then they change direction a bit. And then the cast members come back in and go, wait a minute, this is why we were doing that. Right. So, all right. Um, some of these observations I've already made, but you know, the provisioning of certificates isn't part of the protocol. Um, CA verification, verification is not really resolved in the protocol, it wasn't meant to be, but it's not part of it. So these are all things that were, you know, as I look at, at what's been done, I still need to figure out how to solve these problems for a particular customer. Um, I, I think probably everyone, this is obvious, but I'll state it anyway. You know, it's okay to run a protocol, but I could write anything in firmware I wanted to. I, I could like tell you I'm doing it in a hardware root of trust and I'm actually not. So clearly, you know, you need to go in and, and scrutinize what's been done in, in the code bases of the products you're buying. You need to be rest assured we wrote good boot ROM code, you know, how we implemented reading in uh, from Flash. I think a gentleman was talking earlier about executing code in place in Flash and, and making sure you don't do those kinds of things, right? So, um, you know, clearly within our business unit and our company, we feel like we got good hygiene, but, you know, we're always open to new things. And the fact of the matter is there's always someone out there that's a little more clever than we are, and they find ways to get us to do things in our code that we shouldn't. So we're constantly having to update and work through that, which is a particular problem, as pointed out earlier, because the, the lifetime between instantiation of part and production is, is a long path. So... Um, another thing to point out real quick, and I think I'm running out of time, is we don't really, there's no real good way to detect clones. If, if by example, you pull a part out of the supply chain and you decide to go scrape that part down and figure out what's inside of it, uh, it is likely the case that you can figure out how to clone it. Um, and, and there's some, some mitigation techniques uh, that can be applied to the problem space. But I think in general, it's, it's relatively easy to clone parts. And you know, the, the damage is that you can end up in a place where maybe in a data center you can detect it, but maybe in the broader market you can't. Like I would really expect that if you, if you got back 100 samples of attestation measurements and they all look like they were coming from the same device, that you would have something in your data center that would say, wait a minute, that's not possible. They should all be unique, right? Um, and then lastly, some other thoughts um, around this uh, PCIe uh, protocol uh, that was put forth, I think, by Intel. Um, we actually come up really late in the stack. MCTP comes up amazingly late in, in the lifespan of a part when you think about bring up. And a lot of transactions on the bus have already happened, like, you may have been already doing some, some DMAing uh, because these are actually independent actions. Um, so linking the MCTP network to actual practice of how do you keep it from doing things before that network is up and running is important. Um, the nice thing about the, the PCIe protocol uh, recommendation was that it, it actually happens much sooner in the bring up of a part and you can actually take mitigating steps at a, a much earlier time. Um, but I will say there's some overlap in the two protocols. I actually think they can be used together collectively to solve a set of problems. Uh, like the PCIe suggestion doesn't really solve I2C connected devices. And, and as system vendors, you may decide that you just won't have any I2C in your, in your box, but the pragmatic to, it's pragmatic. There's a lot of things that don't have PCIe presence uh, and you need to connect to it over I2C. So that's pretty much the end of my presentation and I appreciate your time.
and I'll take any questions you might have. Thank you. So it seems like a big part of the, uh, the protocols uh, involved was just establishing a secure authenticated session between two components. Is there, uh, did you look into just reusing MTLS or something like that? That's kind of tried and true. Uh, or like, is there a reason where for, again, not, not using MTLS or something like that? So we're not reinventing anything. And if you go and look into the spec, you'll see that. I just didn't want to comment on what it was being done off of. Okay. So we're, we're not actually recreating how do you do a session, how do you authenticate, what's, you know. There's some other things like certificates where we specified what it should look like. Um, but, you know, we're using common practices to do all these things. Okay. So um, first, it's it's really good that you understand the problem with the certificates. So um, um, this is a thing that really has to be specified before you are final with your specification, right? Um, if you if you don't give your vendors and an, an clear way to verify whether a certificate is valid and what valid means, you give them just enough rope to hang themselves. And make the whole system useless, right? So I worked in the PGP space, and we did that. Didn't do that, and that's one of the reasons why PGP sucks so much, is um, because nobody knows what a PGP key should look like, what is valid. Um, and the second thing is, um, is there an effort to to implement some kind of um, well, reference implementation of all that, right? Because they're the establishing the, the shared uh, secrets, verifying certificates, parsing them. I mean, that's also something that's super complex. It probably has to be all implemented in C, right? We're talking about firmware. And then that's, that's, that's super hard to get right. So um, is, there, is there some kind of some reference implementation that's maybe open? I can look at it and maybe point things out that doesn't look right? Yeah, so... The, the effort in DMTF is really about, about establishing the protocol, not, a, not writing the code on either side of it. It's just about what bits did you define and making commonality. Um, so I wouldn't look to the DMTF for uh, a reference implementation. At least I haven't heard any discussions about it. Um, so you, know, you, you point out very rightly that if I parse certificates bad or I, I do the digital signaturing wrong, or I just have a poor implementation on one end or the other, then, and there can be bad consequences. Now, the only nice thing about the responder and, and requester uh, methods, though, are you know, if you're the system designer and you're expecting the other guy to implement uh, digital signing, by example, and they do it wrong, then you're going to reject what he did at his work anyway. Right, um, you're going to reject his work products. So you're either going to reject the, you know, the, the proof of work. You might reject the um, the, the actual measurement signature itself uh, if he hasn't implemented some of those things. But it, yeah, we don't have uh, within the DMTF any any plan I know of to uh, do reference code. Okay. Uh, so if you don't plan to have a reference implementation, like what are the odds of there being any interoperability between different vendors? Uh, okay, so there's a little tiny problem here. Um, I'm not a liaison for the DMTF, and I probably answered a question I shouldn't have. And now you're asking another question <laughs> I probably shouldn't answer either. So um, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll come, come join the work group. And, and express your concerns about not having a reference code. I think that would probably be a good place. Or just go put it in the portal. Uh, dump it in the portal. So. Okay. Um, I think my question probably is related. Um, so I'm here. Oh, sorry. I was looking for <laughs> sorry. it. Sorry. Yeah. I thought you were looking at the other side. Yep. So... Um, so each device, when uh, you know, uh, when it's uh, attested, basically they need to have the measurements of their firmwares, 
And also when the res- uh, request to get the uh, get the measurement used to the uh, verification. So at this point, uh, does the work group uh, or define some kind of format for the measurement and also recommendations on how to manage, you know, the whitelist on the request side for, to do the attestation or it's just up to each vendor, you know, for their implementation? Okay, so... The, the, the measurement, you know, think of it this way. It's a field in a protocol spec. It's supposed to have a signature block around it. If, if you've decided to do some unconventional measurement generation and the requester is actually willing to accept it, then it'll happen. Like, as I mentioned earlier in, in the presentation, if you said, well, I really don't have any cryptographic capability, and I'm going to tell you that my version, my firmware measurement is version 1.0, and that's all I can tell you, then the protocol would actually allow you to do it because you can just send that over in the measurement field. And if the requester decides that that's a valid way of validating the fan firmware, then so be it. But you, as the requester, you can decide what you're going to accept and what you're not from a device. Um, so I guess, in short, no, there really isn't anything that makes you do something. There are some mandatory things within the spec that you have to go do. Like, you have to do a version. Uh, you have to communicate about versions, and you have to communicate about capabilities. But what you actually put in a measurement field could, could be anything, really. Yeah, I, I basically, I, I think um, my question is, uh, you cannot make these measurements, you know, format of a measurement arbitrary, because it involves, you know, if you do the device attestation or any attestation for any component inside your system, right? So many, a lot of vendors will be involved. It's, you cannot just, you know, let each vendor to implement whatever they want. It uh, It's really hard for a system integrator to, put up, uh, you know, a testation for all the device, mm-hmm. uh, for all the components inside the device, right? Yeah. I, I think in the larger context, you're, you're going to see uh, implementation guidance. Uh, usually a spec will have that. I think a, a lot of specs, when you go look through them, you're like, well, how do I use this? And there'll be an implementation guidance within it that talks about how you might use it. But I don't want to get into any more detail than that because then I'd be stepping on someone's toes. So. Okay, thank you. you bet. I was. I agree with uh, a lot of the last comment, and one of the things that concerns me is if you have a spec that outlines just the protocol itself and makes a lot of assumptions about a direct relationship between the re- the requester and the the respondent and and you assume that they're going to be working closely together, you end up with things that diverge wildly and you have so much variance there that it's hard to, to expect a lot of commonality in that, in that thing. So I, I just want to echo that comment and agree that there, there's a lot of value to trying to standardize. And it might not be the same spec. It might be a, a layered spec sure. that goes above it. Um, the other question I had was about the expectation on the certificates and is there oh this is a certificate what it means is up to you or is there a description in the spec of what the certificate is expected to mean what the certificate is expected to vouch for one of the common problems in certificate hierarchies is we say hey this is a means of attaching some data to a public key and we can attach them into a certificate hierarchy but what it means we don't specify so we've really not done anything besides tell you here's a bunch of keys um, and there's a huge amount of value from my perspective in making sure that that what those are supposed to mean is well specified because a lot of these companies and the, an earlier presenter made the point a lot of these the companies are 
are interested in just selling and meeting a checkbox requirement. And if the requirement is you have to have a key in there, okay, whatever, I have to have a key in there. I don't really bother caring what that means unless somebody tells me, oh, that key has to mean the following things. And it has to be indicative of a secure manufacturing process and, you know, chain of custody of where the keys are held and requirements about what that key means and, and what kind of auditing and, and preservation requirements there are. Um, because okay. without without all those things, I feel like it, it it can easily devolve into a well. This is kind of a a cesspool of it didn't really provide a huge amount of value. So just a piece of feedback, something to think about. So I'll comment on a couple of things you said. Um, one is within the spec itself, there are some certificate requirements of what a you know if you're going to participate in this protocol, this is what your certificate should look like. And there's also some content in there around LEAF versus the entire chain of custody. Um, I, I didn't put it in my presentation, but you're welcome to go look at the spec and it's in there. Um, I've read it. Um, and I agree fundamentally that how you provision the certificates is, is almost more important than anything else, right? Like we're already examining, you know, we're going to have a hardened HSM in our manufacturing site that only we have access to. Um, we also have problems with knowing what we sign. The test systems actually can't be considered trusted. The network can't be trusted. Well, about the only thing that can be trusted is the ASIC that's sitting on the production line. Well, now how do you establish a trust relationship between your ASIC and the HSM so that when the HSM sees it, it goes, aha, I know what you are and I actually know that I'm supposed to sign the data that came over. Um, so all of those things are very important. And, and then and then where you do it is also an issue, right? So do I do it in wafer or do I do it as subcon? So. so I agree all those things are super important. It's just I worry that, and I'm not disputing that you guys are going to do an awesome job. It sounds like you guys have got this nailed. What I'm worried about is everybody else who reads the spec and says, oh, what's the bare minimum I have to do to say I checkbox implement this spec? And they're not going to do that good job. And, you know, okay, there are two vendors who do a good job at this spec and... The rest of the spec is kind of not well implemented. Yeah. Okay, that's good feedback, though. Um, we, we are about twenty minutes over, but this is a super important topic. Uh, I want to thank Jeff for putting himself in the hot seat of uh, with a, a partially written spec. Uh, most companies say no when I ask them to do that, so really appreciate it. And and I'd also say that. Um, you know, the world where you needed a working group and you had to pay a lot of money to discuss a thing, you can now just talk about it on Twitter. So we can just pick five people who care about it and just start a parallel Twitter working group. And it would probably have more influence than the actual paid working group. So just a thought. <laughs> Thank you.